Okay, here's the boring bit. Anything you hear or see in this video is not investment advice. It could be absolute rubbish. Please do your own research. Okay, on this week's video, I have another spreadsheet for you, if you're not sick of them already. But uh, I've been looking at why share prices rise. It, it sounds quite obvious, isn't it? But uh, I've been thinking about it a lot and, and doing a bit of research on it. And that's why I've come up with a new spreadsheet. By the way, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, and if you want the next video to your inbox, don't forget, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. That bell is so important. It sounds a bit obvious, you know, but why do share prices rise? And I've been looking at it, and there's certain reasons why they rise, I believe. I mean, there's, there's things like takeovers that can happen, but generally, this is why. Two reasons, I think, why share price rises, okay? And the first one is a company generates value, all right? The second one is a company releases news that could potentially generate value. V both very powerful. That's very powerful, especially because uh, people, you know, when sometimes you don't know how much value a company can generate, the share price can really overshoot what the potential is, you know? So, what is value? That's the thing we should look at really here, you know? A company can be broken down into two parts. Assets, liabilities. What's owned are the assets, what's owed are liabilities. Now, when a company can grow its assets faster than its uh, liabilities, then the underlying value of that company increases. All right. So, how do assets grow? And I want to keep this quite simple. So, it's like a funnel here. You got revenue growth. That's top line. All right, which is profit growth. And if you, if you, you know, margins, of course, depends how big the margins are. If the costs are expensive, then they may not may not be making money. But if they are making money and the the, the margins are good and the costs are low, uh, then you grow cash and the asset grows because cash is, of course, an asset. All right. So let's have a look at an example. Here's Greg's. Uh, we all know Greg's. We all know they're like a sausage roll. So revenue last year, 52 weeks ended. This is their profit and loss statement, income statement, basically. There's three basic statements, you know, uh, released. That's income, uh, balance sheet, and, or the financial position, they call it now, and a cash flow statement. This is the income, right? It tells you what they've booked, revenue they've booked, and, uh, and all that, and profit they've made. Um, it's not the actual cash, because obviously... Cash can be delayed paying in or whatever. Uh, but anyway, 1.1 billion on sausage rolls. That's good, isn't it, in a year? All right. Now, these are all costs. The red bit's the cost. So that comes out of the revenue. Top line is revenue. These all costs come out. And in the end, tax at the end. Uh, in the end, you're left with what they've actually made here. Uh, profit for the financial year attributable to the equity holders of the parent company. 87 million what they made. Sausage rolls and sandwiches, pasties. It's not bad, is it? All right. But... Let's have a look at the balance sheet, okay? So these are the assets that are owned, all right? So non-current assets and assets. These assets, basically current assets are things that will be turned into cash in a year or less, 12 months or less, and these longer than that, okay? Um, so you've got cash in there, it's 91 million. It's gone up, look, from last year. This is the previous year. This is this year, this column here. So 88 to 91. And so you've got their, their assets have gone up from 488 to 788. You think, wow. That's amazing. That's what three hundred million they've generated in value. Not really, because they've also got liabilities, which have also grown a little bit. You see, one one hundred fifty nine to four two two. So net assets at the end of the day, that's that's these assets being taken away by the liabilities are three hundred and forty six. Now, you're probably worth saying, hang on, well, what did they have last year? This is what they had last year. Okay, three two three two nine, and now three four six. And we can break this down further. So we look at retained earnings. This is the net amount left over for a business after it's paid out dividends and everything. So that profit line you see at the top there isn't necessarily the truth because, of course, they still pay out. But having said that, if you're a shareholder, then you'll get the benefit of having the dividends anyway. So there's obviously income growth and capital upside. But retained earnings and total equity, they're the same. Both those are 17.7 million. So that's basically, after everything else, else is said and done, they've created 17.7 .7 million uh, for the company and also more for shareholders because they've paid out in dividends as well. They've paid out for 70 odd million in dividends. Um, so when the assets grow faster rate than liabilities, the company generates value. That's quite obvious, right? And that's why the share price goes up, of course. So the assets are growing and so the company's value goes up. So they're generating, that's real, actual value. Can't deny that. It's there. It's fact. 
It's cash. It's assets. Okay? So you can see, the, the, the faster the top line grows, everything else being equal, the faster the bottom line grows. You know? Okay, there may be some exceptional costs in the middle, the, the, the margins and all that stuff. But that's why it's always good to look at the revenue growth and the profit growth. Because these two things should filter down into the bottom here and, you know, basically generate uh, greater growth in the assets and cash. That should fill it down, unless there's something wrong there, unless they're paying the you know, admin costs are too high or something. You know, um, so you've got to look at revenue and profit growth. Okay? That's why uh, I, you know, I set up a spreadsheet, and I'm going to be going through that in a second. But also, what you must be confused with is if you look at the filters on the companies I look at, some of them are pre-revenue stocks, and, and they can rise, those share prices can rise uh, on potential generation of values so they release news about something okay and the share price can rise now obviously it's a very hot sector the small cap sector i've done quite well in there over the years and these are companies not not so close to actually generating real value they're generating perceived or potential value in the future all right so if a company releases news stating that the, the clinical trials have started for a drug that's going to you know conquer covid 19 or coronavirus or the uh, drill program has started and they've got loads of um, graphite or you know whatever or copper gold underground or dfs has started it's going to show how much they've actually drilled down there and they know how much potential value that's not value generation that's that they have the potential in the future to generate that value to realize that value because all those things there all three things cost them money so their asset base is going to go down so even the share price could rise temporarily on that news being released it's going to cost them money so their liabilities will go up they have to pay people to do that stuff drilling uh, you know uh, drill people in or they have to you know hire lab space to do d things or consultants to do dfs it's cost a lot of money to put it together and yet they aren't generating any value no no revenues coming in you know they may raise some money dilute the shareholders so in actual fact what's happening is it may rise to this, but while perceived or potential value generation is happening, actual value is going down because the liabilities go up, assets are going down. And that's why in the small cap space, there's a lot of volatility because a lot of companies are loss making. They're not actually generating value. They're saying we will be generating value. But of course, when people realize that, uh, hang on a sec, this has risen quite a lot. This has risen by like 100% in the last two days or 600%. And will they actually be generating that much value? And how long will it take to generate value? Then it starts, people start taking the profit and start selling off and go down. So the rise could be short-lived. Now, in a company that's actually generating value, you know, the rise can be sustained. If you look at the best companies out there you know, the, in the last five, ten years, for example, uh, going from JD Sports to uh, Boohoo to uh, even going back to the, the most popular ones of all, from ASOS to Rightmove, they actually generated real value. And so, have you seen their, 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 their sort of uh, share price? There's been a sustained rise for years. It's not just an up and down, you know, a pump and dump, uh, a pop and drop. It's sustained, you know, sort of uh, value generation, and that's reflecting the share price. So, it's up to you how you want to play it. You can play it in the small cap stocks where they can shoot up and shoot back down, and if you chase the price, you can get burned. Or you can find companies that are genuinely creating revenue then they're growing their profits growing uh, or the revenue is growing and the profits growing and they're retaining lots of you know income going forward the earnings are growing that way you buy a sustained company in a rise for a long time and let's be honest trading can be quite stressful and you've got to get the right share price at the right time if you miss out you could get spiked and thing so when assets are growing faster than liabilities the underlying value of the company increases okay just check the figures and you can look at the financial statements of a company and you know you can look at this and say, well hang on, I see these are growing. So the share price should reflect this. This is why I've come up with a spreadsheet. Okay? Here it is. Let me just find it. This is it. So you can have this, like I say, it's in the link below. Just click below in the link. And what you do is put your name the company in here, ticker there, it's uh, optional. Share price here, you have to put shares and issue in here, okay? It'll give you the market cap. And then it'll it, it, it basically you have to fill out these two columns. It's the current results, previous period, so say for one year or the year before, or maybe interims or previous six months, and it'll generate then uh, the growth here in percentage terms. 
Okay, and I score it. This is my scoring system on these letters. So if it gets by about 33, and I call it in yellow, uh, if it's two, and it's all different scores. So, so what dominates here is growth metrics, because growth is the most important thing. If you want a company's share price to rise, it's got to be growing quickly. All right. So revenue growth is the most important top line. Profit growth before, ta before tax, to, uh, almost bottom line, and cash growth. Profit margin growth as well, that's quite important. You know, if they're growing their margin and they're growing their profit, that's very good. Uh, retained earnings growth is also good. So all these stuff here showing operated cash flow growth, net current assets, net asset growth. If all these are growing, it's very good. And then I've got valuations here, which is important, it's important but, but it's not as important as growth if you want to move a share price. Growth is the thing. Um, I've got health of the company as well, current ratio, quick ratio, net gearing, and efficiency. This is profit margin, operating cash flow margin, profit to cash conversion. Then what happens is you get a score out of 48, because three points maximum on each. Score out of 48, it then converts that into, into a, a percentage score. And down here, you have, you know, you shouldn't go for anything below, below this level here. Uh, 20 to 39 is the lowest. Shouldn't go below 40. You know, if you've got a company that's scoring below 40, avoid. Uh, so here's a few I've done uh, before. There's Greg's, for example. Um, so I plugged all the figures in here. Plugged them all in here. Revenue growth, 13%. That's good for a company with, you know, 1.5 billion. That's decent growth. Uh, profit growth is very good. Look, 31%. Top scores. Cash growth, it's, it's 4%. It's growing, not massively. Uh, profit margin growth is good. 16% margin growth. Is good. Retained earnings, 6%. Uh, operating cash flow goes 61%. Very good. Uh, net current assets went down. So where we uh, current assets there and uh, current liabilities. So see the liabilities are bigger there. Current, uh, it's not a big deal. 66 di difference. This is net uh, there. So um, PE of 14. It's not overvalued uh, currently. Uh, as, as, assuming they'll achieve, you know, what uh, 108 million of profit for tax, um, which I, you know, <laughs> see, I don't think they'll do it this year, will they? But uh, going forward. Probably. Uh, net gearing is good, minus there. Profit margin, nine. Operating cash flow uh, margin. And the score here, look at Greg's. Um, I may, oh, hang on. It's, it's below, it's below actual. It's 38% that. So uh, maybe that was down to this. But uh, maybe avoid. But saying that, again, you have to look at it like, uh, in fact, I'm selling my Greg's. That's it. There are other players. <laughs> uh, I've, I've got to check the scores here, but um, I'm surprised that was below that. But that's that's uh, that surprised me. I've done some others at JD Sports here. Look at that revenue growth. And this, this is the company worth 4.6 billion. They're doing 47 percent revenue growth. Profit growth was 7 percent. Cash growth 42. Profit margin went down. Retained earnings growth up 28 percent. And asset growth. So, so you can see done for all these. This is Tristful, a smaller company. I hold. Uh, revenue growth 21 percent. Good. Uh, cash growth is that's only because they had an acquisition. Uh, it's cash growth is down, but uh, profit margin uh, went up a little bit. M margins are eighteen percent anyway. It's very good. Um, retained earnings. Retained earnings forty percent. That is very. That's basically you know the, the the net income, everything after paying dividends. That's gone up. So retained earnings. Uh, so about three million, three and a half million. Um, and so you can see, you can see it so forth. So they scored fifty eight. Uh, so then I, what I do there is put it there, 58 is a blue, uh, and I give it a blue colour, so I know what it is. Uh, and that's that, all right? And like I said, I do this with, um, where's my, I do this with, uh, oh, where's it gone? Uh, 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 uh. Oh, hang on. I've lost my thing there. Ah, PDF, I said. And I do this with, um, the companies in the first two filters, uh, first three, uh, sorry, not the first one, because this is uh, pre-revenue companies, of course. Uh, what I do look for here is, has the profit target been set or announced? Otherwise, they'll keep generating, you know, pretending they're going to generate uh, actual value, and it's just potential value. And in the end, it's dilute shareholders by issuing stock. So they've got to start generating that cash actual value, which goes to the bottom line. So I do it for this filter, this growth companies, and I do it for this filter here. And uh, by the way, where's my? I'm trying to check out my portfolio for the moment. Is this is what it's like at the moment? I bought BT. Of course, I'm only supposed to have three companies in each, so I may swap one of these out. It may even be Greg's. Who knows? Who knows? Unless they, you know, get above that 38% level. Um, but I've only bought a little bit of this. Uh, what is it at the moment? Um, yeah, 1% exposure. I'm still, you know, two thirds in cash. 
one third invested pretty much. Again, Salt Lake Parash is my biggest holding, up seven percent of that. Uh, eight, yeah, ten percent, sixteen percent on Tristel. I really like Tristel. I was thinking. I saw a video on Twitter um, about Hong Kong Airport, and they've got this little booth you walk through as a passenger, checks your temperature, and fine spray of antibacterial, antimicrobial sort of spray covers you before you go on a plane. And I thought, hang on, what's to stop that being created in every shopping mall, on every plane, every sporting event, but you know, in a shopping mall, having fine sprays automatically, sort of a burst. Every every minute, every half an hour, I don't know what it is, but it would stop, you know, airborne viruses. It would kill them dead. So even if someone in a plane, for example, in a plane, every sort of quarter of an hour, even has coronavirus, you know, the the latent sort of antiviral or microbial sort of spray in the air would kill it dead anyway, and it wouldn't survive for long. So to me, I think that could be done. And I just see companies like Tristel who are in, in this area just getting bigger and bigger. Um, and I think that's the only way, barring a vaccine, that some like, you know, airplanes are going to get back to normal. Or air travel, holidays and leisure, even in restaurants, you know. It's like really fine. In a mall, everything's killed. Dead on surfaces, everything's killed. Obviously, you would you have to be careful with food and stuff. <laughs> but they actually make tasty versions. But I just think, you, you know, you have them in pub toilets. I don't know if you've seen this. You go to pub toilets, there's a little box on the wall. Goes, and just sprays out a little bit of um, a little bit of uh, scent, doesn't it? To make the, the thing smell. Why can't they do that with the antimicrobial, antibacterial sort of spray in every area where there's a confinement of crowds, large crowds? That would kill it, surely. To the, and I just think it's been huge, massive. You know, I sent Tristel an email to the company. So listen, why can't you develop these kind of systems? Very fine spray. In fact, the system's already here. You know the the the, um, the the fire sprinkler systems in big in big shops and malls, like that, but with every five seconds, just a little bit, just a tiny bit, to kill it all. Anyway, I uh, I think that's it. Um, yeah, that was it for my presentation there. Uh, I hope that helps. And if you want that um, spreadsheet, um, I'll put it on the on the link below. You can get that. Uh, and like I said, you know, that's the way forward. But I just genuinely think that little burst, it'll solve the world economy. Thank you for watching the video. If you've lasted this long, I do appreciate that. Uh, give it a thumbs up. Uh, like I said, listen, you can see or you can get a, a you know, a, a, that spreadsheet I talked about in there. You can look down in the description below. You have to be on YouTube, I think, which says show more just below the video. Uh, and down there's a link and you can download that spreadsheet. You don't have to join any list. It's up to you. It's optional. In fact, a box does pop up to say join the email list. I very rarely send out emails though. Uh, but that's optional. It doesn't cost you anything. And uh, like I if you like this video, if you've got some value from it, by all means, you know, um, give it a thumbs up, share it if you could. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, then hit that notification bell. You'll only see that bell once you hit the subscribe button. And you can do that by clicking on my face, my round face. Where is it? There. There, I think. Whatever. And there's also some videos you can watch there. Thanks so much. Uh, until next week.